for my cool yellow, a quinacridone gold for my warm yellow. I've got a quinacridone rose for my cool red and a cadmium red light for my warm red. I also keep a big pile of uh, sepia, just a nice way to punch up some really dark darks. And I like to keep a tube of Chinese white on hand for any little highlights. Um, I don't use that extensively, but uh, once in a while it does come in handy. Uh, brushes, uh, the two I'm gonna use today are the two that I lean on the most. Uh, this is a one inch oval wash, squirrel hair. And this is a number 14 round, kind of a little wonky there. Uh, this is a squirrel synthetic blend. I like natural hair brushes, they hold more water, uh, but synthetics are, have improved so much in the last few years. Um, using blends is a perfectly acceptable option. So without further ado, let's jump into this big sky. Um, I don't know how many of you are painting along, but if if I'm going too fast or you need me to pause so you can catch up or let something dry, just, just speak up. I'm happy to adjust the pace for you, that's fine. So I'm gonna start off, I'm gonna do the, the first layer of the sky is just to put wet into wet. Okay. No that background. A question or just background noise? Sounds like background noise. All right, and I'm just starting off with clear water on here. I'm just going to try and get a nice even coat over the whole thing. Not sopping wet standing puddle, but evenly wet. I'll tilt this into the light so you can see what I mean by that. Take it all the way down the page. So you can see it's it's not dripping, but it's it's good and wet. Go back over it if you need to, to make sure it's kind of even. Switch out to that round. So I'm gonna start out with that blue sky. I'm just using straight cobalt for that. And we're gonna look at those clouds as, as negative shapes. So we're kind of painting around those wispy clouds. One thing to keep in mind when you're working like this, where you've already got water on the page, that water is automatically diluting your color. So you want to go a little bolder with your color than you might if you were working on dry paper. And just kind of lightly going around where those cloud shapes are. And as I move down toward the horizon, that blue sky lightens up. As you start looking through the atmosphere more, the color fades out a bit. So lightening that up as I go. Are you watching? I'll look over your shoulder. No, sit in the other one. Okay, if you're not asking a question, do please mute yourself. That's a big help to me. So I rinsed out my brush and to start getting those, those wispy, wispy little feathers, kind of rinsing it out and just quickly tapping it on the paper towel and I'm actually lifting up some of that paint. Letting that pull away from the cloud. I'm told those are called tail clouds. Lovely name for those. <laughs> Just sort of creating some direction. Leads and <clears throat> feathery places.
Come back with a little more blue there, kind of break that shape up a little. Blend it out. And I don't think you need to be too married to a photograph when you're working like this. It's okay to improvise and take it in your own direction. Okay. Sometimes that paint is going to want to go in a direction you weren't expecting, so sometimes you just go with it. <laughs> so I'm just kind of working back and forth, lifting and putting paint down right now. And as we get down closer to the horizon, we start getting some of that sunset uh, peachy warm pink glow coming up from the bottom. So where I've got those negative spaces that are just white paper, I'm gonna start adding some color in. So I'm dipping into my quinacridone rose and my lemon yellow. I want it pretty diluted to start with. And I, I almost always tap my uh, brush on the paper towel after I've loaded it up. It repoints the brush and keeps you from having uh, absolutely dripping paint. It's a little more controllable. So I'm just dotting that in really lightly because this is so wet, I can keep playing with this. It's really diluted. And trying to think of putting it on the underside of the clouds since the sun is down here, that color is coming up from underneath. It's working really lightly. I'm going to push a little more uh, quinacridone rose in there, start getting a little more pink and a little more color intensity into it. I'm still thinking about those feathery, feathery shapes. Now, as I come down here, I've got another layer, a bank of sort of violet gray clouds that are gonna come over these wispy clouds. I just wanna go right through that for now. Just ignore them. We'll do that as another blaze. And with the, the sunset color, it does the opposite of what the blue does. It gets more intense as it's getting down toward the horizon. So that sun is lighting up the atmosphere at that point. And right in here where we have the, that little sunspot, we want some really intense color forming there. I'm gonna keep pushing a little more color, a little more intensity, getting a denser puddle on the page there as we go down. If you haven't worked a lot with quinacridone colors, they are very intense. You get a lot of a lot of bang for your buck on those colors. Go with some straight lemon yellow right in the center of that little glow spot. I'm just kind of tweaking and playing a little bit here with that color. I'm going to carry that wash right down into the water. The water is obviously reflecting the sky for the most part, but it's a little um, like a grayed down version of what's happening straight overhead. And I just added a little blue into that red and yellow mixture. Add a little 
more blue as we move to the left here. And just pull that out to basically a dry brush. Just start to dissipate that water so it'll dry. So nice wispy clouds, lots of little transitions going on there. The blue lightening up toward the horizon and the, the pink and yellow lightening up as it goes away from the horizon. It's sort of a blotch going on there. I'm just gonna blend that out. Big advantage to putting that uh, layer of water on there before I started is that I had lots of time to kind of play around with those edges and blend my colors back and forth. This up here is almost dry. You can see it's lost its sheen. Or down below, it's still pretty wet. So I'm gonna pause for a minute and kind of let that, that sink in before I start doing anything else. Does anybody have any questions at, at this point while we're watching paint dry? <laughs> nope. Nope, okay. So this little white house, the body of it is white. This railing is white, but it's, this is gonna be fairly twilighty view. It's dim light and white is always reflecting what's around it. So it's reflecting the water and the rocks, the wet rocks, which are reflecting the sky. So it's gonna be kind of a blue gray. I'm just gonna go ahead and drop some of that in there. Just into that wet wash, it's not gonna hurt anything. Just to sort of establish that, that value and that color to start. So we don't lose track of it. Okay. Not quite dry enough to put that in. Okay, so we've got a, a very faint horizon line over here. And then we, obviously we have this tree line being in the, in the background there. I'm just gonna lift up some of this paint to get it drier. So we can do kind of soft wet into wet edges while this is drying. I'm just gonna go ahead and put those in. That distant uh, land mass is just gray. And gray is just the three primaries together. And I'm keeping everything cool at this point so that it recedes into the distance. Just the tip of my brush, just really kind of lightly dot that in. Just a little wet. So I'm going to mute myself for just a second and use the hair dryer to dry this so we can move to the next step. Oh, I, mute myself. I don't think I can mute myself while I'm screen sharing. Margie, can you mute me? Uh, let me try. The wonders of Zoom here. <laughs> There's always a kink somewhere. <laughs>
Thank you, Margie. You're welcome. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear the hair dryer. Okay, so that's pretty much dry, more or less. You can see, I don't know how well you could see, but that paper actually started, it had curled up a little bit, just a little arch to it. And as I used the dryer on it, it started flattening back out again. That's the big advantage of that 300 pound paper. It really, it wants to be flat. Okay, so next step, I'm gonna come in with these overlaying a set of clouds, these kind of gray violet. And again, we're staying with the cool trio of colors, the cobalt, the lemon, and the quinacridone rose. And I'm going for the violet gray. So um, one of the things I like to tell my students when you're trying to mix a particular color, a really good strategy um, is to try and start with a neutral gray and then push it in the direction you want to go. So I'm just going to mix till I have a middle ground and then push it in a direction. So it can be a green gray or a blue gray or a violet gray. When you're out in nature, um, you're seeing the full range of the rainbow in everything you see. Natural light has the full spectrum of color. So when you're trying to mix colors that look like they belong in nature, even when you've got a brilliant sunset, adding all three primaries in there to moderate the color is going to give you more natural colors. So that's why it's always a good idea if you're struggling with getting a color you want that looks like a natural color start with that neutral gray and you can push it in any direction you want to go and as far as you want to go. So I mix just a tiny bit of color in at a time, just barely dipping into that. It's got a nice pinkish violet cast to it. Dilute it a little and again, just tap that brush on the paper towel so I have a nice sharp point. And I'm just gonna do uh, right up on the tip of the brush, almost a calligraphy sort of approach to putting in these kind of uh, wispy bank of clouds down near the horizon. And right off, I can see that value is a little stronger than I want. So I just dipped it in the water, just diluting the paint that's already in the brush. You don't have to start over and remix. You can adjust your values as you see fit. I'm trying to get just some nice irregular shapes in there. One of the things the human brain always wants to do is try and organize everything. We wanna make everything symmetrical or in even patterns, everything regulated, which is the opposite of how things happen in nature. So you really have to remind yourself when you're painting landscapes to um, you know, create a random texture, to consciously make things uneven and irregular. I'm diluting this out to kind of vary the intensity of this a little, just so it has some depth to that cloud bank. It's not all in a flat plain. Lots of nice feathery shapes around the edges and then we get into the bigger body of it. Just put a little more pressure on the brush and create a bigger, a bigger stroke.
as I get down to the horizon, it gets a little denser, that cloud. I'm gonna add a little more blue in there. Just give it a little more depth, a little more oomph. Don't want to lose that little bright spot where the sun is. As I get over to the lighthouse, I can go right through the top. Obviously, that's darker. I want to make sure we go around that white body. Just slow down a little. Work around it. Stop at the horizon line. And over here, I'm stopping at the top of that railing. Carried this right down in through that uh, mass of trees in the distance. Go back and continue some of these over here. And lots of variety of shapes, trying to vary sizes and keeping a general direction going. Backwash there, you can touch up. A pretty simple little wash gives you a nice overlay add some depth to that and you've got some nice glowy pink happening where you added that more intense color so it feels like that light is right behind there so after this is dry we can come back with a little more intensity there along that edge where we have that sun and even use some chinese white to get that super white bright yellow where the sun is peeking through. I'm just going to sop up a little extra water here. Just to encourage a little drying. Make sure we don't get any uneven uh, blotches through here. So we're just kind of building background to foreground at this point. We, are, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, you know, we work with light to dark as a general rule. So that usually means uh, distant to foreground. So as we start moving forward here, I'm gonna switch to the ultramarine blue. It's a warmer blue but it's a denser, darker blue. So to put in those trees in the background, I'm gonna want some, some density to that, some contrast there. So I'm gonna to shift to that darker blue, but stay with my uh, lemon yellow and my quinacridone rose. So we start moving toward the, the foreground. You're gonna warm up the colors, but you, you gotta kind of play with that mixture a little bit. 
If you go too warm, too fast, you've got things that should be sitting back here, feeling like they're up here. So we're gonna start gradually shifting to our uh, warmer primaries bit by bit. And even though that's a really dark dark, looking at the photo, that looks like it's just as dark as this foreground, which is all gone black. This is the danger of working from photographs. Um, quite often, this is what happens. If you adjust the exposure to get all the beautiful color and subtleties that are happening in the sky, everything on the ground goes black. If you adjust the exposure to see what's actually happening here, all of this will get burned out. It's always important to work from life because of that as much as you can so that you understand what you're looking at when you get a photo like this. If you just work from photos, you will never have a natural looking thing. Your eye sees so much more than, than the camera ever can. More color, more value, uh, the whole shebang. So that was leading up to the point that this background trees needs to actually be a grayish dark. These are gonna be much darker darks up in the foreground. So I wanna be careful to moderate that, that I don't go too strong, too fast on that value transition. So it's really kind of a middle value, even though it's contrasty. And my paper is a little wet, but it's dry enough that I can work on it because I got a nice fuzzy irregular edge to work with here. I'm just kind of going along with the tip of my brush. So I'm gonna zoom in a little so you can see this. Just using the tip of my brush to create that irregular edge and letting it kind of bleed up. It's trees, they're irregular and, and kind of squirrely edges anyway, so it works. And then I can just bring that down and have a sharp edge at the water line where it's dry. Again, just working the very tip of my brush. I just blotted it a little, get rid of some of that wetness. I rarely use a small brush. A really good brush with a sharp point is going to get you a lot further than a tiny brush. A tiny brush won't hold the amount of paint that this brush does. I can go for a long time with this without having to reload the brush. And I can do uh, tiny strokes or big washes with it. I always try to go with the biggest brush they can get the job done. And usually if you've got a good point, you can go pretty large. So just being mindful of the shape of that edge and then kind of filling in, pull that wash down. Again, trying to be lots of variety and irregular shapes there. So if you compare the value of what that looks like on the page, compared to the value of it on the palette, it's quite a bit lighter on the palette because you're glazing. You're adding more value than what you're actually putting on the page. You're building up paint on top of paint. It's good to kind of gauge your values based on what's already there. Put the bottom of there to Finish that out.
tough ones to drift on me here. Okay, so I'm gonna start working down in here. I'm gonna put the base of the uh, lighthouse and these under piers. And we're gonna pull that right down in here and start creating some suggestion of rocks and vegetation. And we're gonna do that in a couple of layers. But bit by bit, we're just gonna keep building that up. So again, working with the ultramarine. I'm gonna push in a little quinacridone gold. We're stepping a little closer into the foreground here. So two warms and a cool, basically. Ultramarine, quinacridone gold, and the quinacridone rose to kind of modify that. So these stone buttresses underneath the the lighthouse and the walkway. Just a fairly neutral dark, but warmish. Again, working from gray, always working from gray. Some nice simple shapes here, nothing complicated. These uh, buttresses have a dark and a light side. We're just gonna ignore that. We can come back and just add a little dark on one side later. So, quick little thing there. So it isn't running into things. I'm just gonna take that and start pulling this down, establish that rocky edge here. And as I move forward into the foreground, start creating some negative shapes, kind of masses of rocks. And again, just using the tip of my brush for some kind of calligraphy marks. I'm just thinking about uh, scale and perspective a little bit. So those shapes are gonna get bigger as we move forward. And I want that color to get a little warmer, even though it's still a dark gray. Start giving us a sense of there being some bigger boulders here. You can see how that's already creating a sense of perspective and depth in here. Just very gestural, quick, simple shapes. We're gonna go back over this.
Any questions so far? Oh, you are a very quiet group. <laughs> Okay, so always kind of just uh, pause and check how your paint's drying. Check and see if you got any little backwashes or little things that need to be tweaked or tinkered with as you go along. So I had tried to put in that little little distant mass of land earlier and it was too wet, it just bled out. So I'm gonna go back and just very lightly put that in. Switch back to the cobalt. I'm just going to mix into the edge of this puddle of gray, just a little neutral cool. It is super important if you're painting anything with water in the distance that you get your horizon line straight. Sounds like a simple thing, but you'd be surprised how many paintings I've seen with Tilted horizons, water running off the side of the world. Probably done a few as well. <laughs> so I've got that layer of rock outlines, basically, just a little suggested texture. I'm gonna come back over that with a wash because that was just thin uh, calligraphy lines. It dries really quickly. So I'm gonna start with my ultramarine and my quinacridone gold. I'm still gonna stick with my quinacridone rose. So the rocks were uh, kind of a grayish granite but they're obviously reflecting the sky. They're gonna be very cool. They're all in shade, very little light on them. So we don't wanna go overboard with those warm colors. I'm really gonna emphasize more the Quinacridone Rose and the Ultramarine Blue as I'm working along here. I'm just gonna start really flat brush, just doing a wash over this begin with. Warm it up a little. Lots of variations in color on these things is what I'm really aiming for. Oops. All the pink on there. So we're using that warmer transition to establish depth again. Go a little bolder with some of your color variations. So I just keep dipping in and, and remixing and shifting those colors around. All within that gray palette, all still relatively cool. Giving me lots of variety. And obviously I'm not too worried about what's happening in this edge here. I'm pretty sloppy with that because there's a big dark tree that's going to come over this and cover most of that. A little more color in here. Lift this up so you can see a little better. So 
just some subtle color variations, just giving you more transitions there. So landscapes in general, you're trying to get that depth, that atmospheric perspective. So you're using values, you're going lighter to darker in the distance to the foreground, you're going cooler to warmer, you're using perspectives smaller to larger. So you wanna keep trying to think about the relationships of everything, one thing to the next, every step of the way through the landscape painting. So this is obviously way too bright. We wanna to tone down that uh, uh, lighthouse and walkway railing so that it, it's cool, so it settles down. I'm gonna take some of that uh, cobalt. And again, just working back into this same gray puddle. And keep mixing and mixing right into that same puddle and get endless variations on there. And I want it to be near this cloud color, really. That's really sort of the, the tone that it's reflecting. It's still going to read as white in the long run. It's giving us some contrast with that bright water. And I'm just sort of softening that edge so I don't get a hard line there, just dragging some of that paint out. It's a simple, subtle thing. So I'm gonna work some more on those rocks, but I wanna let them dry at this point. We're gonna do some dry brush and we're gonna add some vegetation in there. So while that's drying, ooh, drip, don't do that. <laughs> I'm gonna go back and, and start working on this big tree. So that tree is gonna really come forward. So we're gonna shift to our much warmer colors. A lot of a splash here. So I'm gonna to shift to my um, trio of warm primaries. So I'm using my ultramarine blue, my quinacridone gold, and now my uh, cadmium red light. The cadmiums, uh, whether red or yellow, are very sedimentary colors. Um, ultramarine is also a very sedimentary color, which means exactly what it sounds like. The pigment itself is sediment, it's granular. So it sits on top of the paper rather than soaking in and staining the paper like a lot of other colors do. Which means that if you're glazing, if you're putting layers of color, building up layers like we're doing here, if you use those cadmiums or ultramarine or uh, something like yellow ochre or a cerulean. Those are colors that are gonna lift up very easily. So you wanna reserve those for a top layer of paint. You don't want that as an underpainting. So it's just something to be mindful of as you're choosing which colors to mix at any given point in a painting. So I want a nice deep rich green, but I don't wanna to go to black like the photo, we want it to have some sense of light in there. We push that quinacridone gold in there a little more, brighten it up. Delete that just a bit. So again, load up my brush, tap it on the paper towel to repoint it so I have control. And I'm, I'm exaggerating this tree trunk a little bit. It's got kind of this nice little snaky uh, tree trunk at the top. 
That's a really nice, nice lyrical quality to that form. I think that'll be a nice contrast to all these nice hard, raised, straight, rigid lines that we have here. Think about how all those things interact in your painting. So for this tree, I'm gonna work light lacy uh, edges. And then we wanna do denser, larger clumps, masses of color as we move toward the body of the tree. So I'm gonna start out on the edges, just working right at the tip of my brush. Let's see if I can zoom in a little for you. And trying to keep track of where I want that trunk to go. So I'm just gonna put that in a little bit right to begin with. And thinking about the character of that tree. You've got pine needles, got spiky things sticking up. So you want that to kind of read, even though it's distant, you're not really going to see the details of this. But just some suggestion of that to lead your viewer around, let them understand what they're looking at. So little strokes out on the edges, bigger, fatter strokes toward the trunk. And it's all sort of backlit here. So you've really just got a silhouette, but we still wanna try and use our color, some variations in the color to give us a sense of, of there being light, of there being some glow. So just kind of giving myself a little guide with that tree trunk. It mostly gets swallowed up as I move down the tree, but it's giving me a sense of direction there. It's giving me a little guideline to work from. I'm gonna punch a little ultramarine blue into my mixture here and actually just drop it into that wet paint. So there's a little sense of, of tucking under, those branches tucking in. Working a little faster as we move along here. So really working with the tip of the brush, thinking about some branch structure as I'm working along. And again, as we spoke about before, thinking about lots of variety, varying those shapes. You wanna make sure you don't have this ending up looking like a wedding cake. So it's, you know, tiers of even layers getting larger at the bottom. Lots of variety, variety, variety. And the further we work our way down the tree, the more dense it's going to get, the less light you're gonna see coming through there. Reload my mixture here. 
You can see how wet I'm working here. There is, hopefully, get the light to catch that there. Big puddle at the bottom of that tree. It's almost dry at the top, but where I'm working, there's a big puddle that gives me lots of time to stop and remix paint and come back. As long as I'm pulling away from where I've already painted, I've got lots of time to play with that. It's so important to keep it as wet as possible. It seems counterintuitive, but the wetter the paint is, the more control you actually have. This kind of feels like you're teetering on the brink of running out of control. The thing is just gonna run off the page, but it's not gonna run away. Most of the time, sometimes it is. <laughs> So as I'm coming down here, I just want to occasionally let a little uh, peak of light show around the trunk. Some suggestion of branches again. And that's enough to really give you a sense of that tree, what you're seeing, how that's reading. Get the little turn up on the end there. Zoom out here so you can see the palette. So I'm mixing and remixing this puddle as I go along and it's getting denser and darker as I move down to the base of the tree. I'm getting less and less light as you move down. I'm going to get down to where this is actually landing on the rocks. I want to attach it to the ground. So I'm going to take some of that dark, dark, and create some branch edges, a few suggestions at least down there. But then I'm just going to pull that dark down into the rocks and do some more of that calligraphy like we did to begin with. And we're going to add some sort of vegetation, um, suggestion of vegetation sort of cropping up between the rocks. Um, probably not obvious from where you're looking, but I actually have tilted this up. I've got it setting up on my laptop there so that all that paint is flowing away from where I painted. As I said, I wanna keep pulling that down so I don't get any backwash or those awful cauliflower marks we all abhor so much. So kind of following along where I already had some of those calligraphy marks, looking at uh, how those rock shapes intermix. Add a little more yellow and red into that mixture. I'm gonna blot my brush out and do a little, a little dry brush. Just pulling that up. A little sense of shrubbery, 
weeds, whatever. Zoom in so you can see that a little better. Not everything has to be super well defined, but just some suggestions of connections being made. The light spots there that don't make sense. I'm just gonna fill them in. So I don't know if you could tell that I had a drip of water there that I blotted up earlier. I'm just going into that with some of this dry brush and making it into a weedy patch. Compensate for that really easily. So um, I'm looking back at this at how things are drying. You can kind of see there's a dry line there. But there's a little puddle here that's sitting there next to an area that's drier. So I'm just gonna squeeze out my brush on the paper towel and just siphon up some of that extra paint. Again, just trying to make sure I don't get any backwash, anything happening that I can't control. So all dark values, just using three colors on that whole tree but there's still a, a, there's a nice sense of glow up there at the top and a sense that we're getting down into deeper shadows at the base. Just varying that mixture as we came down. Add some more of this vegetation down here. One time. Just kind of let that scatter out a bit. And again, this is stuff you can't see in the photo um, because I was there and I know, I know what it was. I can kind of improvise and make up a little bit, make it what I want it to be. So at this point, the rocks have pretty much dried. I'm gonna come back and start adding some punch to these foreground rocks, give them a little more texture and definition. I'm gonna do that with some uh, dry brush technique. And I'm sticking with that warm trio at this point for all this foreground stuff. So I've just added a little more ultramarine and a little more of the cadmium red into this green mixture and pushed it to a fairly warm gray. I want it pretty diluted. I want to go overboard on this. I'm going to load up my brush and I've kind of flattened it out. You can see. I might even squish it on the paper towel a little bit to take some of that out. I'm going to press down and lift up. Press down and lift away to get that dry brush. This to a point where you can see it. If I'm doing a painting where I know I'm going to do quite a lot of dry brush, I will work on rough paper. But for this, it can be pretty subtle. We're not going overboard with this. And not every rock needs to have the same texture, the same degree of definition. Even vary the value on that. Maybe do a whole thing to pick up in the air.
I'm gonna cool that off a little bit as I move back into the landscape. Just adding some more of that blue. And as with everything else, it's about relationships. So I've got strong dry brush texture here and just pretty, pretty wet, subtle texture as I push back. Just keep layering this stuff in. And as I'm working with these rocks, I want to start adding some, some maybe um, light and dark sides, some faceting to the rocks. The light is pretty soft over here, so it's not going to be real contrasty. Some definition here and there. So I spend about half my time probably, or a third of my time doing plein air painting, working outdoors, painting from life. So that when I come back to the studio and do something from a photograph, it's usually a place that I've painted before, that I've become familiar with the colors and the light of that particular place makes a huge difference in how you approach uh, working from a photograph. And even if you're just working from a photograph, you're gonna end up with something that feels like the place you've been if you've painted there and really closely observed it in person. I'm just kind of playing around with shapes and textures at this point. Add a little dark side to some of those grasses. to find some rock shapes here. I'm just kind of letting it tell me what it needs at this point. doing here. You don't want to get too carried away with defining things. It's dim light. So at this point, I start finessing. I start looking at relationships and what needs to go lighter, what needs to go darker, what needs to go softer or harder. So we've got a really high contrast right here with this rock that's way too bright for where it is and a little bit over here as well. So I'm just going to go back into that. It's not quite dry, but it's dry enough. I'm just going to cool that down. Oops. 
I'm going to use my ultramarine blue and quinacridone rose and some of that quinacridone gold to kind of modify that color. Color mixing, try to always be patient. Just mix a tiny bit of color in at a time. Keep modifying that mixture till you get it where you want it. I'm looking for some of the a cool violet gray here. Dilute it in my brush a little bit and just come in with a, a wash. Let it go right up into that tree. It's not gonna hurt the tree. Let me tone that down, make that feel like it belongs tucked into the shade there. Into the shadows, rather. Let's go ahead and pull it right into those grasses. Create a shaded side on this foreground rock. Again, just improvising, getting a feel for what creates the depth dimension here. So there's a nice contrast here that gives a nice sense of depth, but it's probably a little strong. I'm just going to tone that down just a little bit, really dilute that mixture I just made. Just push it down just a hair. So that gives me one more step of transition there. Keep, keep pushing that depth, keep pushing things back away into the distance. Go ahead and put the, the rest of this little lighthouse in. It's a nice focal point in here. Adding some cobalt blue into this mixture. Real quinacridone rose. Put in the shaded side. Dark. back into this darker mixture, add some cadmium red in there to give it a little more brownish hint. Put in the top. It's little fussy things here. So in something like this, really the only place in a painting like this that I would use the Chinese white is where we're going to go back and do that sunspot. And I put a little spot there for the lighthouse light, just to give a little, little spot, a little punch of focal point in the painting. Smooch there. I'm going to go under here and darken this a little, get a sense of tucking under. Some little detail-y things. I'm starting to get there. I'd like to go back into this tree and see if we can add a little more dimension to that. It's pretty much just a flat silhouette. So I'm gonna go in with some darker darks. Again, my, my dark warm trio, my ultramarine blue, quinacridone gold, and cadmium red light. We're going to push that ultramarine on this. So a nice dark, dense dark 
like dark, dark, dark. <laughs> and I just want to try and do some suggestion of the undersides of these branches, the things kind of tucking in, just to add a little dimension there to make this more of a three-dimensional looking tree instead of a flat tree. And using those same kind of strokes, those little delicate leaf strokes that I used on the outer edges to not blend it necessarily, but just create another layer of uh, foliage there, no suggestion of it. And in some spots, you're going to be doing it as a negative. So it kind of tucks behind. And again, even in something like this, where you've already established the major shape, you really have to be conscious of not uh, doing a regimented pattern. That's really important. A little hard to read that here, but Little bits of variation. Sometimes those little subtle things are, are what makes the whole painting read as a whole. Punch up some of those branches. And even with this, I'm going to get bigger, you know, more broader strokes as I move down here. I'm trying not to hit everything. So you get a little sense of some lighter branches catching light on the other side of that tree. You're peeking through at that. So sort of a creating a little window there. It's building and building as we go here.
again, working negative space there. And again, with my color mixing, this puddle is getting denser and darker as I move down to the base of this tree. Tuck things under here. Reestablish some of that contrast. Some sticks, some bare branches at the base. Lots of variety there, but again, just creating a little more depth and dimension to that. So one of the things I like to do as a little sort of finesse toward the end of a painting is really look at where those edges are working or not working. We've got a really hard line that's formed on some of these clouds. Um, well, that's where you can see it. So when you're working it really wet like that, sometimes the pigment will sort of gather along the edge and you get this really hard outline which doesn't really look like a cloud. So I'm just gonna lighten those edges, soften all of that. So it looks a little lighter, a little airier. Really simple trick. Just gonna rinse my brush out really well in clean water. I actually have, uh, this is one of the handiest things I have in my studio is a divided bucket. So this side is the water I've been working in. I always have some reserve water on the other side it's clean, so when I want to do something like what I'm about to show you, something clean to dip into with having to go stop. So clean brush, clean water. And I'm just going to lightly, with the very tip of the brush, turn that out a little bit, go right along that edge where all that pigment has gathered. Just very lightly go along and lift some of that up. Blot it with a clean, dry paper towel. And I'll zoom in in a minute here so you can see the difference. Just going to go along and soften those edges. Feel a little more cloud-like, a little less uh, cartoon-like. And just little, little finesses you can do as you progress through a painting.
you don't really want to scrub. You don't want to mess up your brush or your paper. You don't want to be lifting pigment from the surrounding area. You just want to soften those edges really lightly. You can see on this cloud, that top edge where I've softened it, that bottom edge where I haven't. It's not a huge difference, but it's enough to give you that sense of, of light coming through the clouds there around the edges. Just a little bit more of that. Super light touch. Okay, let's get this little sunspot in there. Now we'll wipe off a little clean area on my palette to work. I don't really want a dark green sunspot. actually wipe off the paint, make sure I have clean pigment to work with. I have a little dried uh, Chinese white on the palette. I'm not going to use that. It's good if you want something very diluted, but if you really want a, an intense um, opaque mixture, you need fresh Chinese white. I'm just going to put a fresh little blob there, just a small dab. I do not recommend that you keep this on your palette. It's so easy to just accidentally get some of that mixture in, or some of that Chinese white into a mixture that you're working on and it dramatically changes the character of the paint and the way uh, the color dries. So I'm gonna take a tiny bit of Quinacridone Rose and a little bit of lemon yellow Warm that up a little bit. And I want my mixture to be almost all of Chinese white. Chinese white, when you start mixing it with pigment, it actually will dry much, much darker than what it appears when it's wet. So that's a super pale pink, but it will be a much stronger pink much darker pink when it dries. And I'm just gonna punch that in, this little bright spot here. Rinse my brush out. It's really hard to see, isn't it? I'm going to load up some straight lemon yellow. A little more Chinese white. Put that in. Pretty bold here. You can always soften this later. If you want a real punch of light there, you have a nice contrasty piece. You can also add color to the Chinese white after it's dry, sort of as a glaze over it. my brush out really well and go back in with some more Quinacridone Rose. Modify that a little. So it sometimes takes a couple of tries back and forth to get exactly the color you want because it dries so differently from what you see while it's wet. You really figure out the color intensity. 
You can play with that a little bit. Orangey glow here. I'm just kind of dropping a little color into that white that I set down. Or the lemon yellow in there. Let's see if we can get a nice punch. And get a little sense of that sun glowing right behind that cloud. So I'd still like a little more punch in these foreground rocks. I'm going to add a few more spots of dark. I'm going to dip into that uh, sepia that I haven't touched yet. So a little ultramarine with sepia. That's going to give me a really, really dark, dark. I'm going to use that sparingly. Just add a few little uh, spots that kind of imply a little deeper hole there. Just trying to give a little more punch and definition as we move into the foreground. Little bits here and there. Here. But I'm drippy today. Try not to get too linear, but punching up those shapes. Pull some of that up into the grasses. I'm going to wet my brush and just soften one, one edge of that. So the top edge, I'll let that bleed out into the edge of the rock. It's more of a shape than a line. Just playing around with those textures and transitions. More contrast there. A 
the little details again, back to that little lighthouse. Door there. So there's a zigzag, intricate zigzag pattern on this railing. I don't wanna do that whole pattern. It would become too much of a distraction. I'm just gonna mix um, bluish gray that's suggestive of that uh, background tree bank, but I don't wanna go that dark. We're just gonna do a few little marks to get the point across that kind of give you an idea of what's happening without actually drawing every piece of railing. Well, you can't see that a lot, can you? camera malfunction there. So just a little, a few little gestural lines to give you a sense that it is a railing, not a wall. Don't take much. So a pretty abstract little pattern there. The last little thing on there, I'm gonna put that light in the lighthouse. And that's this, uh, the Chinese white with a little bit of that yellow in there. A little spot there I'm going to pick up. So I want to do uh, one more thing on this water. I'm just going to do a little dry brush stroke across here with some gray, this cloud gray. Give it a little shimmer, make it look more like water. So we're going to go back to that cobalt blue, monochrome rose and lemon yellow mixture that we used for that cloud. Again, always patient, patient with your mixing. Load up my brush, squeeze it out on the paper towel. So I've kind of created a wedge shape with that brush. I'm gonna drag it with right on that edge of that wedge, edge of the wedge, like Dr. Seuss. Real strong, so dilute it a little, keep going. Just a white shimmer. And now the water looks like water. Okay, kids, I think we have a painting. What are your questions? What didn't you get? What did you think was working or not working? So I have a question. Yes. Do you, do you always put fresh paint out when you work at home, I, you know, on your own without a demo? I do not. I, I use, um, I go through a lot of paint, obviously, since I right. paint pretty much every day. 
Um, but I never get rid of any pain. So I keep building on it, but I, I, if you're using good quality paints and it does vary from brand to brand, they should reconstitute well enough that you don't necessarily need to do fresh paint. Um, I really love Holbein. I really love um, M. Graham. They both reconstitute exceptionally well, I think. Um, Daniel Smith also. Um, but no, I don't always use fresh paint. Thank you. That was a great demonstration. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Anybody else have questions, comments? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, within a painting, do you combine different brands or do you always stick to one brand within the same painting? Uh, I combine different brands. I, it, it, it's a lot based on individual colors. Individual pigments vary a lot from brand to brand and I, I'm sticklers for certain colors from certain brands. Um, I don't use a lot of Winsor Newton, but I, I always use them for Cerulean. I love their Cerulean. It's not like anybody else's. Um, let's stop share on here. This is distracting me. Um, uh, yellow ochre I like in, in Winsor Newton. I absolutely hate their blues. I won't use <laughs> Winsor Newton Cobalt or Ultramarine. Um, so it, it's, it's a lot of playing around with different brands and finding out what you like, particular pin, pigments. You don't need to stick to one brand at all. They interact just fine. Yeah. Anybody else? I left time for questions. <laughs> So I'm, I'm teaching some online Zoom watercolor classes uh, through Chesapeake Fine Arts Studio, if anyone's interested. Um, uh, they're once a week, usually on Tuesdays, um, but they do videotape or they tape the, the sessions so you can go back and review them whenever it's convenient for you. Um, I will have a new uh, probably four or six week session starting uh, mid-May. Are these on your website, Susan? Uh, there's nothing posted there now, but yes, as soon as I get the next session uh, scheduled, when that opens up for enrollment, it will be on my website, susanlinstudio.com. Just click on classes and it'll be there. And I also have a, an email newsletter I send out once a week. Um, it, if you're interested, uh, any new classes will be in that uh, newsletter. And that's the first place I put uh, any new work I have, both watercolors and oil paintings. I work in both media. Hmm. So that's all, you can also uh, sign up for that on my website as well. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, Susan, do you look like you used one brush for your whole painting? What was the type of brush you used again? Uh, this was a number 14 round. I love uh, the silver brand, their black velvet series. It's oh, okay, a, great. Yeah. It's a squirrel synthetic blend that holds a ton of paint and has a nice point and they're inexpensive. They wear out quickly because of, you know, what they're made of, but they're inexpensive so you can keep replacing them. Great. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? I'm at your service. Now's your chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much. You guys were very attentive. I appreciate that. I have a question. When yeah. you are out doing a plein air painting, mm -hmm. how much time range do you spend out there painting per painting or do you finish it in the studio? Do you finish it out there? Um, generally, I try to finish it there. That's always best. Um, it, when you're outdoors, you've got about a two hour window before the light has changed so dramatically that you're not looking at, at the same thing anymore. So try to keep it within two hours. That doesn't always work out, but <laughs> that's the goal. Um, 
you know, if you have an overcast day where it's nice, even light, you can paint a long time, which means you can work bigger. Um, but if I'm, if it's a bright sunny day and I know the light's going to change, uh, yeah, I'll try and keep it down to under 11 by 14 and, and get it done in a couple hours. Am I unmuted? I wanted to know if that was Maine, that painting. It was Maine. Good eye. I, okay, thank you. I thought I thought I recognized it, but I thought I can't say. Okay, <laughs> That's thank the you. Marshall Point Lighthouse. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I uh, am very fortunate that I get to go spend, uh, other than last year, of course, uh, a couple weeks up in Maine at the end of the summer with a group of artist friends. We rent a big house and we just go paint all day, and then we eat and drink all night. We all share communal meals together and it's fabulous. It's like summer camp for grown up artists. Nice. So I, I, yeah, Maine is a, a treasured place for me. I do a lot of Maine paintings as nice. well as Massachusetts. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh huh. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'll say thank you. It was a lot of fun. Good. Thank I you. I enjoyed watching it. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Susan, thank you very much. Excellent demonstration. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Good. <laughs> well, I hope it was helpful and maybe you learned a thing or two. <laughs> or at least interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it was very good. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Susan. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So goodbye, everybody. Don't forget to check Facebook tomorrow. Gotcha. Oh, Thank you. We'll do. Bye. 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 Bye.